you give us an example of this so that we can get ahead when we do trades on World of Warcraft? <laughs> but the question you have to answer before you do this is, do you know yourself? <laughs>
things that are very, very different from what we're talking about here. Um, he received a Nobel Prize for economics in 1994. Uh, and so, funny side note: there is no, there is no Nobel Prize for mathematics. And I, I'm sure Wikipedia will have a better version of this story than I do. But it's something like Nobel didn't like the best mathematician in Sweden and didn't want him to ever win the prize, so he didn't make one. It's, some, it's something along those lines. I don't, I don't know exactly. Um, but in 2015, so just, just this year, uh, Nash, who is 86 and still alive, uh, he won the Abel Prize, which is Norway's math prize, uh, which is kind of like, you know, modeled off Nobel Prizes, but only for math, uh, because there isn't one for math. <laughs> uh, and that's on his later work on partial differential equations and algebraic geometry. So he spent most of his career at uh, first MIT and then later at Princeton. Um, yeah, so we have this problem, 1950, way, way, way back when. So let's consider the situation. So it's called the two-person bar two bargaining situation. We have two people, this guy and this guy. Uh, and they can, you can choose to collaborate for mutual benefit. So person A, person B, um, collaborate in some manner. They can make choices and exchange assets of some sort. And if they have different valuations on those assets, it may be that exchanging assets will in, in improve each person's situation. Say, so say for example, Mac and I are, are trading items. I happen to have a lot, a lot of, cho of uh, children's toys. Mac has lots of, I don't know, vegetarian food. Are you vegetarian? No? No. I'm vegetarian. So the vegetarian food might not be as uh, highly valued by Mac. I have no children, so the children's toys are not highly valued by me. If we exchange these things, then we both have a greater utility. So I have now food I can eat. Mac has uh, toys, for, toys for his children. Uh, and so we've, we've made an exchange um, cooperatively. We both have to agree to do it. I can't just steal the stuff. Uh, and that has increased both of our um, our total goodness, our happiness. Uh, and there's this sort of moral question of happiness that actually I think it's, gets into this. Um, so, however, there, there, need, there need to be, for our setup here, multiple ways of collaborating. So if there's only one option, well then, no, no, if no one has any choices, uh, then what's the point, right? It's like there's only one possible thing to do, well then that's either you do or you don't. So we're, we're talking here, we have a different a set, set of possibilities. So I can give you half the, half the toys, and you give me half, we can figure out uh, some sort of equivalent value and trade parts of them, something like that. So there's a, a set of, uh, of strategies that we can, uh, we can, we can do, uh, and there, there needs to be some choices. Um, so uh, it, we're going to simplify this case a little bit. So the bar, in general, this, this is sort of fairly broad. One simplification we're going to make is we're going to assume that no action may be made without consent. So I can't take your stuff. If we're going to engage in any exchange, then we both have to agree to it. Um, there are a couple of implications from this. One is that any collaboration we actually do will, uh, of necessity, either not hurt either one of us or it will benefit us. So if, if a collaboration with Mac uh, hurts my position, I would just choose not, choose not to enter it. So I, I, would, I could do nothing and I would be better off. So I would only do something if it will improve my position. This is assuming I'm rational. And that's a big assumption. Um, and so the, this, the, the case in which we do this, uh, the simplified case that this paper talks about is one of what's called bilateral monopoly. Monopoly. Does anyone know what this term means? Anyone know what monopoly means? Any, any definition? You have complete control over a resource. Yes, complete control over a resource, in particular, the only seller in a market. So, okay, is there an example of monopoly? Manitoba Hydro. There you go, Manitoba Hydro. <laughs> uh, excellent monopoly. No one else can sell electricity to you. It's not a perfect monopoly. You can put you can put up a solar panel if you want, but Generally speaking, it's a monopoly. And does anyone know what a monopsony is? Monopsony. <laughs> there's only one in the entire area. So they're like a monopoly, but they're just one stage further. Not quite, no. So if not, monopoly is the only seller in the market, monopsony means there's only one buyer in the market. So uh, I, think the, I think the example on, so monopoly. One buyer, 
one seller. And if the market is in a situation such that if both of these are the case, then you have a bilateral monopoly. So it's both directions. There's only one buyer and only one seller. So the example which I suspect, which I think the Wikipedia page for this gave, uh, was for um, nuclear-powered uh, warships in the United States. Only the Navy buys them, only one company makes them. And you're like, who else are you going to go to? You put on 10 tender and, hey, I'll make some for you. Um, but there are situations where it might not be a perfect monopoly or perfect monopsony, but where these things are uh, sort of approached that in the market. So oftentimes, I'll telecommunications, historically, not so much anymore. Um, rail transport, often, like passenger transport is often uh, monopoly. Um, but the the one, one situation which can be, which, well, might, but probably isn't, usefully, usefully modeled by, the, by this kind of relationship, uh, is one of a single large corporate, large employer uh, in a, in a say, a small town, four street, four, so a small town that's got, you know, only a pulp paper plant or only a mine, uh, and then this, a single, like a highly, highly effective union uh, of the people who work at that mine. So you have one, basically, one set, one buyer of labor and one seller of labor. And that, that, that could, could be sometimes modeled as a bilateral monopoly. So that's the kind of situation we're in. So this is, we don't have like, oh, you don't want to buy it, I'll sell it to, sell it to Rob. The two of us, we have to uh, engage in some sort of collaboration in order to improve our position. And there's, there's no other options. Um, these kinds of principles can be generalized later, but not in this paper. So, bilateral monopolies. We only have one buyer, one seller. That's key. All right, so we're going to make a couple of, uh, of uh, ah, yes. So what, what we're going to do here is we want to define something be like a, called something like a solution to our bargaining problem. And the solution would be, if you represent it as a number, is the number of sort of how happy we are by the outcome of our bargaining. And so if we can increase that number to make ourselves happier or to optimize that happiness, then this is, this is successful. So our, our goal here is optimizing happiness. So this is where we, so where we get into the moral ideas and the, what the 18th century economists are talking about. So I'd like to make some assumptions. We're going to assume rationality. So we assume that Mac and I are capable of making rational choices, that we know what we want, uh, and we, we know how to value what we want. Yeah. Do we also assume that the your opposite person is rational? Yep, everybody's rational. And also you have full knowledge. So that means not only do I know myself, I also know you. I know what you want. Um, so is this like chess? Like perfect information? Say? Yeah, so yeah, the, the, con the, con the modern phrasing is perfect information. Um, I suppose chess is a matter of perfect information. I guess so, yeah. I suppose it would be. I don't see why not. Um, but I, more particularly, I have full knowledge of how you value things. So in, in our examples, um, in it's it, examples aren't perfect, right? So does the giant corporation and does the giant union know precisely how the other values what they want? No, but they can probably do a pretty good guess, right? Like, like you know, both of these organizations, like, you know how much everyone's being paid, you know how much they want, that's like on the table. Like uh, oftentimes in, a bar in that kind of bargaining situation, you put an entire bargaining offer down and then both sides do like union's version, employer's version, and then they negotiate them. So it's, uh, it's, is it perfect information? No. But is it something kind of approaching that? No, sort of. Um, so that, sort of that, that sort of physical. Perfect information, full knowledge, rationality. Uh, and we also need to assume that both parties are equal in bargaining skill. So you're both good at it. In our example there, both parties can aff afford to hire very good lawyers. <laughs> um, so, this, so these are kind of our assumptions. And skill partners. So we're trying to avoid situations where someone does something stupid and someone gets an undue advantage. We actually just want to say, like, if we both sit down reasonably and totally openly, uh, how, what can we negotiate? And how will that uh, improve our situations? So the question then is, how does one measure this? What does it mean to, to measure happiness? Right. Um, so happiness is notoriously difficult to measure. Um, and again, this is where this kind of this kind of question, which is a, a 20th century um, way of understanding sort of what economics is, ties back into a much older tradition of 
of meaning and, and sort of philosophy. So there's a philosophy called utilitarianism. Utilitarianism. And there are a couple of uh, important theorists who contributed to various versions of this, of this philosophy. One was Jeremy Bentham, who also famously wrote about prisons, and another was John Stuart Mill, operating in the late, in the, sorry, late 19th, or late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, a quote from Jeremy Bentham, uh, quote, it is the greatest happiness of the greatest number that is the measure of right and wrong. Uh, so that is, if you, if you perform an action which maximizes aggregate happiness, that's what makes it moral. Now, I think that's complete nonsense. Um, since there are all sorts of individual actions, right, which could be entirely immoral, uh, that might, in some sort of ill-defined larger picture, uh, increase happiness, right? So, like, do you, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's a classic, uh, classic example of how this moral reasoning is really difficult. So if you're on a streetcar, the streetcar is going towards a group of five people, and it's gonna hit them and kill them. But you could flip a switch, to divert the streetcar to hit one at one person. Now, if you do nothing, you haven't made any choices. So you didn't kill those five people. But if you flip the switch, you have performed an action which certainly killed one person. So the question is, is it moral to decrease the number of people who die? And that, that's the flip the switch. So would you or wouldn't you? And this is, this is a, a difficult ethical problem. Um, and it sort of shows, I think, probably why this line of reasoning is, I think, false, but regardless. Um, but one of the ideas that, of, that utilitarianism uh, suggests is that you should be able to calculate the happiness factor of any action. So how happy would doing action X, buying this thing, eating this thing, going to this place, how happy would that make me? Uh, and then you should put, you put, a, put a number on it. Like, the enjoyment I have of having eggs for breakfast is seven, oatmeal is five. Right, like, and then you can, it's, it's the quantified self, right, in, in the 19th century, in, in the 18th century, even. Um, yeah, I, I, I suspect I've already made clear that I think that's nonsense, uh, that you can actually do that to everything in life, and they use that as a basis for forming government. Uh, but that's the, that's sort of the idea. I'm, I'm not going into details of Bentham's or Mill's thought, but that's sort of one of the ideas. Um, there's even a, a period in John Stuart Mill's writing where he suggests that Utilitarianism, there are both higher and lower forms of, of happiness. And the, his conclusion, one of the conclusions from that, which I expect he changed later in life, was that people who graduate from university should have more votes than those who haven't, because they are better able to understand the nature of goodness, like higher goodness. <laughs> right? So, now, of course, we're talking a time period when not everyone could vote, right? And whether you could vote or not was dependent upon, generally, it varied, uh, how much property you owned. Right, so it, there was a the, the franchise was a different thing than you know, today we have general, essentially universal adult franchise, uh, but these are the kind of ideas. And one of the things was a unit of measurement called a util, which was a sort of dimensionless thing. But you know, this thing is, is six utils, this thing is seven utils. If they both cost the same, I'll take the one that gives me seven utils of happiness. Like that's the kind of theory. So this is sort of where this comes from in economic thought. But for our purposes, we will be ascribing. We'll say. This is possible. Okay, so you can describe a numerical utility to an action. So the action of engaging in some trade, I can look at the stuff I have now, I can look at the stuff I have after the trade, I can calculate how, many, how much utility I have from this, and then if it has gone up, then that is something that's good for me. And I wish to maximize that number. Why would I not wish to be as good as possible, or have as much goodness as possible? Like that's sort of the idea. So that the utility of something can actually be calculated. Um, now the phrasing this, that, uh, well, I'm going to give uh, Nash's example here. Now, these things, of course, don't always happen in the present. You might know something might happen tomorrow. And so the phrasing that, uh, in, in our negotiation, we don't trade things and then calculate. We think about it, anticipate how things are going to be and what will be good or not for us, and then we trade. So this, this notion of anticipation. And so I, I, this, this, uh, this phrasing is not used anymore uh, that I'm aware of in how game theory is talked about. Um, it's essentially, I'd have to read more modern game theory, but I, essentially it's expectation is how we usually use this word. 
But we're talking about here, again, 1950, before some of the various modern ways of talking about uh, probability expectation have been worked out. So we're going to use the, the, the uh, nomenclature from this paper, uh, which is not modern. <laughs> don't, I, I don't go around telling anyone about anticipation, because they won't know what you're talking about. Um, so an example that uh, Nash gives, uh, if you know that you're going to get a Buick tomorrow, it's, it's a Buick, it's amazing, it's in the paper, um, then you have an anticipation of one Buick. You don't have the Buick, but you have the anticipation. But if you all, but say you change the situation up a little bit, I tell you tomorrow I'm going to flip a coin, and if it's heads, I give you a Buick, if it's tails, I give you a Cadillac. So what do you have today? Well, you have a half Buick anticipation, and you have a half Cadillac anticipation. Right? So, so you have a, a probability mixture of two possible outcomes. And if you value those things the same, well, it doesn't matter. right? If, you, if one Buick is worth 10 noodles, uh, then, and if one Cadillac is worth 10 noodles, then half of one is five, half of the other is five. You still get the same total expected increase to your, to your, to your utility. Um, so, but, but and more generally, I'm going to put this right here. If you have some proportion, some probability P uh, of some uh, anticipation A, and then 1 minus P, also known as Q sometimes. Right, so it's a, any probabilistic mixture, and of course P is in 0, 1. Uh, well, I guess technically 0. Um, so it's some probability mixture of two possible outcomes. If these have the same value, then it doesn't really matter what P is. Right? The, whether it's 99 percent this and 1 percent that, or all the way around. So there's some probability of these two anticipations. And so we'll call this a probability combination. So in particular, this is some probability thing, and then a combination, but the V sum up to 1. Uh, the prob it's probability. So it's probability. So we're going to make some assumptions. May I write over here? And so our assumptions are going to be the, set, the setup which allow us to do the rest of the paper. But we'll also see that they're actually kind of reasonable. And we'll see why they're reasonable. So if a person with so an individual has two possible anticipations, with two anticipations, Uh, can decide which is better or which is equal. So that is to say, you that rational person has the capability, given two possible things to happen in the future, you can you, you know which is best for you. And this is this is important. If you can't do that, then what's the point of this? You, if you don't know what's good for you, no one else will. But, just, but this is an assumption we have to make. Uh, we're going to assume uh, that, that these uh, anticipations are transitive. Anyone remember what transitive means? Switch. Uh-huh. Um, they can be switched. Yeah, that's commutative. Oh, see? No. <laughs> All right, so if anticipation A is better than, and I, he doesn't use greater than or equal to, but I'm going to use it because like, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, as long as it's directional, better than B, and then B is better than C. So I know I prefer this thing to this thing. I know I prefer this thing to this thing. Well, then it must imply that I prefer A to C. All right, so there is a comparability across these items. Now, that this is necessarily the case in real life isn't clear. Right? It could be that you really, really don't like B. And, well, I don't know. I tried to think where this wouldn't be the case. <laughs> but, yeah, rock, paper, scissors. Rock, paper, scissors, okay, not transitive. Uh, but do you like them? <laughs> utility, if the opponent has the other, but. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's conditional utility, yeah, so <laughs> then you actually need even more complicated, right? So, yeah. um, but we're assuming it's transitive. So that is, you have this function of what your utility is, and you can, you can compare things. You can say, uh, this better than that, uh, that better than that, so therefore this thing is better than that one. Okay, that's reasonable. Um, we also want to say a probabilistic combination of equal utility is just as good. 
So there are two possible outcomes. This one here, and this one here. And they, either one of them, I like. The same amount, just as good. Well, I can take half of this and half of this, or a quarter of this and three quarters of that. So the prob probabilistic sort of anticipation is equally fine. Because if I like either of them equally, then I don't really care if my probability of getting this one is p and this one is 1 minus p. It doesn't matter, because it all still sums up to the same, same value. So this is, this is good. Um, fourth assumption, uh, if A is better than B is better than C, it implies there exists a combination of A and C uh, as desirable as C. So, in the simplest case, this is, this is actually really straightforward, uh, if I take 0A and 1C, it will obviously get C. Right. Um, if some of, these are, some of these are actually equal, then I can take other combinations. This is almost, almost a non-statement, but it, it just says that the co essentially the combinations, it's kind of like the ham sandwich theorem-ish, remember that from first year calculus? Sort of like, the, if things are in between, and then everything's probably going to be fine. All right, so, so if these and these are well behaved, then this thing in the middle is kind of forced to be well behaved. That's, that's kind of the idea here. But it's, if these are actually strict inequalities, this, unless I'm seeing this terribly wrong, uh, re resolves to being almost trivial. Okay. And another assumption. Some probability. Uh, a and B are equally desirable. So either one, I'm happy with them. Uh, then P, so this is PC and PB, one minus P C are equally desirable. So this is saying that if these A and B are, I'm happy to have either one of them the same. I'm just saying, well, you put, take P of it, and then C over here. It doesn't matter, because these are just as desirable. You can essentially switch, switch them out. So what that is saying is, in any of these equations, if you have A and B that are equally desirable, you can just move them around. Doesn't matter. We don't care what the actual outcome is. We care how, how, how desirable it is to you. So this is, this is the sorry, and reasonable assumption. Uh, because if you did care, well, then they wouldn't be equally desirable. <laughs> and that's just the, if you preferred one or the other, then, well, there, you've got, that's, that's the whole point of it, is what's preferred. All right. So now we're going to find a, to find a function u. So this is u for utility. And the utility function, uh, on some anticipation, so on some future event, calculates a real number. So this maps from set of all anticipations, I guess. Anticipations into R. So we get some real number. Um, well, I said, let's not push it properly. You so some it takes take, it, it takes in its input as an anticipation, and output is some real number. So that's the actual value it gives to you. This function exists. Now, again, in real life, does this really exist? Probably not. <laughs> but in certain constrained situations where you have a lot of lawyers and money and information, something like it might exist. Um, I mean, a couple of things for this. So, so what this means then, of course, is that u of a greater than u of b. So what, what, what would this mean then? If this function, yeah. You like A better than B? Exactly. If a number that I assign to A is bigger than I assign to B, that means that I like A more than B. That, that's how we define this function. It is your utility. Uh, and then, sort of following very straightforwardly from this guy over here, we say that we see that this behaves linearly. So U of probability of some anticipation A plus 1 minus P probability of anticipation B. So this equals 
to P U of A plus 1 minus P U of B. So all we're saying here is that this function is linear. So uh, that is to say, constants can come out. Uh, and if you have an addition inside of it, it can be, it can, the sum of the arguments is the argument of the sums, basically. So you can just pull it out, P of U of A plus 1 minus P of U of B. No, no, linear. Okay, oh, it's, it's both. It's both. Because yeah, you've got, we're doing both, uh, both uh, under addition and under uh, multiplication by constant. So it's a, a linear function. There are plenty of linear functions. Integrals, uh, summations. I right, like there's all sorts of. So it's totally, totally standard. Uh, of course, integrals and summations are the same thing, really. <laughs> um, So we're getting a well-behaved function. Does not cause, not cause too many problems. So let's do, uh, yeah, do I need an example of this? No. Just well-behaved, straightforward. So let's just remember we have this utility function u. That's going to be really important for us to pick. All right. So we're giving, we have a set of utilities. I know my utility, all the values, and who the other player is. I have full information. The first question I have to ask myself before I even worry about what I want to trade, what, what strategy I wish to adopt is, is it even worth playing? Right. So of course you all remember that sometimes the only way to win is not to play the game. Uh, but that, but the, the actual question you're asking is, what's the overall value of the game? So like, how, what can this bring to the parties and together or individually. And this, since we're talking about two people, I'm actually going to sort of uh, change up my definitions a little bit. So a two-person anticipation, uh, so instead of having a, 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 a future thing to anticipate for one person, is for two, be some set A, B. It's just uh, two, one person. So this is an anticipation for me, this is an anticipation for Mac, and the ordered pair of them is a two-person anticipation. Simple. Again, this is not modern, wait, uh, 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 sorry, pardon me? Either. No, no, not modern uh, terminology. Terminology, oh, right? It's not, not how people talk about today at all. Um, <laughs> this particular this phrase is very funny, but it's two of them, maybe, because there's no particular reason to imagine. In fact, one would almost think it wouldn't be the case that we ascribe the same utility to a given situation. But why would we? We're different people. We have different. If, if we were identical, then there probably wouldn't be much bargaining we could do, because whatever we have, well, or we could bargain everything and it wouldn't matter, I guess. And right, if we ascribe the exact same value to everything, we can exchange an equal amount of them and nothing would change. So neither, neither of us would have our utility increase, but then anything which would have a decrease, we would just refuse to do. So if we, it's a good thing that people don't have precisely the same value on everything. Um, that's actually the core of sort of all sorts of things. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. And so in particular, we have all the same things we had before. Probable to combination of some joint anticipation, minus P, A, B, uh, which just as well. Um, so we, we can define this, like this is, what does this mean? Well, we just define it quite simply as the combination of P, A, plus 1 minus P, B, plus equivalent thing over there. Just saying that this doesn't really change anything. We're just defining how we uh, apply the same probability of some set of uh, possible future events uh, as the set of future events under that probability. So you, can bring, you, can bring, you can bring the P in. Um, oh, this should be a, this is some other one, sorry. These are separate and different things, sorry. Yeah. So we have probability of some joint event and one minus P some other, other joint event. It's just 
bringing the p into this, bringing the one minus p into this guy. So that's 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 pretty straightforward. Um, so it's just as linear. All the other kinds of things we talked about are all equally well defined for these two person anticipations, and they are for the one person anticipation. And just as well defined family for n people. Uh, you know, 17, 500, whatever. Um, although the other stuff can be harder. Um, so, all right, so, if you're, so just remember if we're in a bargaining situation and we both refuse to cooperate, then what happens? We don't do anything. What, no, nothing happens, right? So let's say that the utility, utility of no cooperation is equal to zero. So what we're really talking about is the increase in utility uh, of cooperating, right? So if we do nothing, no change, that's zero. Zero for me, zero for Mac, doesn't matter. So we're not, we're not actually, not, this is not an absolute utility function. And it's not the utility to me of my current situation. It's the change in utility. So it's the, if we if we cooperate and do something, how does my position improve? Uh, it will never get worse because if it were to, I would just refuse to do it, and I would stay at zero. So zero is the the, the bad is sorry the, the the least bad I could do. I may agree to do something which will improve my improve the situation. But I will never agree to do something which will make me good. Okay. So then, of course, that means that u of a is going to equal to zero for all, for all a, which are rationally arrived at. <laughs> right? This is like rational behavior, not rational numbers. So for any rational behavior a, I will never have a negative uh, change in my utility. Yeah. Would it be then beyond the scope of the paper's uh, expiration if you uh, consider potential utility or negative utility of an arbitrary to derive decision, say you're talking about the uh, union and employer bargaining consideration, not doing anything, not cooperating, may result in a possibility of arbitration with anticipation of potentially negative, potentially positive outcome. Unknown well, the, 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 the probabilities. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah, imperfect information, of yeah. course. And so the whole purpose of this, this setup so is, yeah, is, is yeah. perfect information. Yeah. Okay. Uh, once you start tossing imperfect information in, yeah. then you can't calculate this function all the time for everyone. And then that gets really much harder. Right. Because um, knowing this function, you can use that in, in your strategy. Um, and just remember, we're in a bilateral monopoly, so we both have to choose to agree, and you can't go anywhere else. Right? So if I say I'm not bargaining, well, Max can keep doing whatever we were doing before, buying the same price. Because like, if it was working for him before, why would it not keep working for him? There's not some change. Right? So, but we're, you know, we, all know, we all know everything is the idea. So this is sort of the bulk of the notation. Um, sort of all this notation is really only do one thing, and I'm, I'm going to do that one thing with the picture and not with the notation. <laughs> but whatever. Okay. But, it, but it, it, it's, it's important just to sort of see. I mean, if we're going to see the paper, let's just sort of see how he talked about it. All right, so. Um, okay. So let's, let's talk about what the setup kind of looks like. So we're going to graph. Uh, graph here, and we'll have two utility functions, u1, so for the first person, u2 for the second person. Generally, these utility functions are different. Again, for different people, we have different priorities. Uh, I don't really like ice cream, somebody else really likes ice cream, we'll put different values on ice cream. If you make a milkshake, I'll be happy. Uh, <laughs> that's just how it is. Um, and so we'll put one in one direction, so this is u1, so this could be me. Who, who wants to bargain with me? Any takers? Me. All right, Rob. So, so this is uh, in this direction, uh, given. So, and then we're going to have this region here. We'll represent. Um, so, for any given anticipation A, um, U1 of A is some value called N1, and U2 of A is N2. So, this means there's some. Uh, arrangement that we've agreed on, some, strat some strategy which we both agreed to do, we've collaborated, and we each get some real number, I'll show it's not given an N then, R1, R2, uh, some real number uh, utility out of it. Uh, and so what we'll, we'll graph this is, well, 
x coordinate, y coordinate. So say there's some arrangement A right here, and then this distance here, this is uh, R2, this is R1. So this distance over is how happy, how, how much it increases my utility. This distance is how much it increases Rob's utility. So every possible, um, every possible strategy which we could agree on has a value because we have claimed that you can, we, we can calculate it always. We're rational beings. We know our wants, we know our preferences. We know what the other guy wants, what the other, what the other guy's preferences are. So given any setup, we can calculate its utility. So it's increased, again, again this is increased utility. So this is our default. If we do nothing, we're zero, zero. Do nothing. All right, so these points are good study. Okay. Now how do we find, we want to figure out where the good ones are. And so in order to do that, we want to find some way of constraining this. So any, any thoughts about uh, how the stuff we've already talked about might come in handy for that. We're only going to be in the first quadrant, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the useful ones will be in the first quadrant because n neither of us will ever agree to anything that was negative. Yeah, correct. So we're going to be here. Not here, not here, not here. Unless we're all essentially Damascus. <laughs> but if you like that, then it would be a positive utility. <laughs> right? this, is the, like, this is the problem with the entire conception. <laughs> No, it's not a problem, but that's just funny. Um, okay. But of course, the problem is if you like having the other person go down. Griefing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> then, this, then you're never going to agree, right? Because we require the full collaboration of the parties. Right? So, uh, so if, yeah, if making the other person feel bad is good for you, then this is not a good setup for you. Uh, and I, I would be surprised if some anomalies uh, behave that way. <laughs> Um, but in particular, say we have two different outcomes. There's B, or these. These are both uh, possible anticipations with calculated um, calculated uh, utilities. Can these tell us anything about the space, what this looks like? So if I, yeah? It's sort of upper bound, it's kind of envelope. Well, there could be something else up here too. Uh, but these are just two possible ones out of some large set. So remember we talked about how we can do uh, linear combinations of utility functions with probabilistically. So half of this one, a quarter, uh, half of this one, a quarter of this one, three quarters of this one. So essentially, if I want to take part B and part A, that's going to move me somewhere along the line between them. So if I go here and a little bit of this guy, oh, it'll be here. So what this says is that anything, in, if these two points are in what I'm going to, oh, I'm missing a beta notation. Hmm. Looks like there's one under your sword. Ah, oh, yes, that is the next page. <laughs> 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 All right. Um, will, will S be the uh, set of feasible solutions? So the set of solutions where there actually exists some possible anticipation, like something, that could, something that could actually happen, and the um, and then S is in this space uh, a set of, of utility function outputs, correspond where the inputs are uh, feasible feasible strategies. Um, so in S, well, if B and A are in S, then by linear combination of B and A, everything between them must also must also be in S. And so we were just saying a little bit of B, a little bit of A. Well, it's going to be everything between is included. So if I get a third point, what happens? Same thing, you just connect all the dots. Yeah, there and there, and there and there. But I, I could also, by linearity, I could have a combination of all three of them, as long as the probability adds up to one. That's going to fill everything in. Because right here, the centroid is a third of each, or this is here, a little bit more B and C, a little bit more B, so you get everything. Um, and I don't know what this property is called. Or between any two points, the things in between them must be a member. Familiar? So let's see something that isn't. So say we had this with a solution space. Right? This is the set of possible feasible solutions. Why not? But then yeah, I take this guy here, take this guy here, 
Oh, all of these must exist. Okay, so this couldn't have been, this could not be a solution space because these must be in it. What is a shape like this called versus a shape like this? Non-convex. There we go. This is non-convex. So in particular, we've just shown that our solution space has to is going to be convex because of those linear combinations. And if that's the easiest way to be convex is having linear combination difference. Uh, so this is a very straightforward way of being convex. Um, we have to make another, another assumption, which is a, it's a reasonable assumption. Can anything have infinite utility? Like, it, would it, say that again. Can anything have infinite utility? Can some exchange be, have a value to me which is infinity? Your life. <laughs> but again, like. It's an existential. <laughs> but the, 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 to me, no, no, no. But the exchange would, because if you if you do nothing, then nothing changes, right? Yeah, so you just had a kid. <laughs> 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 well, it, it, it kind of does get existential. Yeah, like, um, no, no. It, it's okay. There isn't infinite money, right? There isn't like you, you can't. Yeah. So that, so yeah. we'll assume that this is uh, always um, less than so. Well, by the definition of infinity. Uh, mu is less than m for some m in r. So if there exists a number such that mu, the, the, the mu of whatever it is, is less than that, so it's bounded. At some point, this, this at some point our set s stops, and you can draw a big box around it. Okay. So we can draw a box around it. So if, if s looks like this, whatever, I can draw a box around it. It's bounded. Uh, that's, uh, this is important for the proof to work, but also it, it's intuitively reasonable. Like, it's kind of a, the, the old the old saying: uh, everyone has a price, right? Like, there's a price. It's not infinity. <laughs> um, now, back up again. We're in this whole context where we assume rationality, we assume perfect knowledge. Again, probably false, but for this context, it makes sense. So it's convex, it's convex and bounded. Um, yeah, that was Pedro when they talked about. And so now we have a, a pretty straight, straightforward, straightforward problem to solve. Where, what, where will the optimal solution be? So they say this is actually this is the solution space. Oh, except this is convex. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. How do you find the optimal solution? We're very closely done. To which line? On the convex? Perpendicular. Well, I'm imagining it would be some kind of convex optimization. Yeah, and th this is, so this is actually before most, most of uh, um, linear, linear programming existed. It, it's really, really, it's the, the easiest linear programming possible. Imagine this line right here, the uh, you know, 45 degree line, negative, right there. That's it. Right, that's the point which is on the floor, uh, the point right there, boom, 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 which will be the optimal solution for both Daniel and for Rob. Just toss it right in there. Now, as I said, like, this, this predates most linear programming. Linear programming is really a child of the 70s. Uh, that's why it's called programming. <laughs> if it had been written in 1950, it wouldn't have been called programming. <laughs> um, I think maybe some of it goes a little bit earlier than that, but not by, but not by much. Um, so at the core of this, this is like the, the simplest linear programming ever. You optimize uh, with this line right here, bam, you're done. And that's the proof, <laughs> right? Like, but the, the but this at this point here, if there's one of them more, there could be several of them. So that you could be, it could look like this. Uh, you'd have like a whole series of possible optimums, optima. Um, this this is called now called a Nash equilibrium. Uh, and then sort of these other ones here. And so when you're dealing more generally with game theory problems, uh, you would generally assume that there exists a Nash equilibrium. And then that's the, like, the set of games that have a Nash is what you're working with. Uh, and there's also the characterizations of them, characterizations of them, what they look like in multi dimensions and whatever, and whatever. But the core idea um, is that, oh, there's one, actually one other nice idea which, which fits in here. Uh, which brings about the relationship between uh, the difference between bartering and having money. Right? So uh, say we each have a set of assets to which we ascribe some utility. 
uh, but like discreet actual goods. Um, but we don't have any money. So we can't just say, all right, here, I'll give you these things, and here's some extra cash to make up the difference. Um, what you could, what you, you, could, you could see this as uh, the actual sort of, if everything, if you had money, again, this has to be convex, <laughs> uh, if you had money, this is like the precise value, so if all those continuous possibilities existed, that's what this would look like, but there's some subset, which is probably gonna have more, right, more uh, straight lines in it, which are the possible, the possible things that can happen with barters, like the different relation, the different um, uh, combinations that are allowed, allowed with the different areas, different values. And so, but this is clearly going to be a subset of this. And so if this has, if this has an optimum, wherever it is, uh, you're gonna be able to find an optimum there. It won't be as optimal, but if you can only barter, that's what you'll do. If you could make up the difference with money, you get up to there. Um, so bartering. But I guess we're assuming, I don't know if we said this, but that both players are utilitarianists in the sense that they think of the whole system, or else I don't think the equilibrium makes sense. Because then you argue because one person can make it out better than the other, but the system remains. So remember, like, remember we're in a bilateral monopoly. There's only two players. Nothing else is happening. Yeah. So the system making. Oh, you're saying. I'm just saying that, that diagonal line, if you have yeah, a bunch yeah. of points on it, then like, I we can have this net utility, yeah. utility of the system is the same, but one person yes. makes it out better than the other. Yeah, so these are all match equilibria. Yeah. Um, but presumably in that case, the one that you would pick would be the one when uh, not quite the middle, in, in a relationship to the, to, the, to the slope of the line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, but, it, it, but it's only going to be actually hit a line in this situation if the slope is actually minus one, right? Right. So it will be, it will, it will be the middle. Yeah. But yeah, that could be the... Yes. Okay. That's fair. Um, mm -hmm. Would you take the one that's closest to the line uh, x equals y? That will be the, that will be the middle. Yeah. Yeah, that has to be the middle because of this, this, and this, right? Uh, oh no, wait. I, I'm, I'm less convinced now that this actually happens in this very particular case. Okay. Um, I have to think about that. Yeah. It's huh. degenerate, so just ignore it. Exactly. That's how real geometers do it. <laughs> so yeah, so this is the this is yeah super like again this is, this is 1950 and this is uh, this is the genesis of the notion of Nash equilibrium. Uh, John Nash, thank you very much, John. Uh, Yes, that's it. Did I go for 20 minutes? How long was that? I don't even know. Under an hour, slightly. Oh, oh really? It was that long? Oh, thank you for listening. <laughs> so, any questions? First, let's thank the <laughs> <laughs> Give me your worst. No. Oh, <laughs> okay, you caught me there. <laughs> I told you, I spent five hours a week fencing. Yeah. Although, not with balls throwing at me. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we made a lot of assumptions and we're like, well, this isn't quite realistic. But in this age where everybody's like, you said more economists are testing, have people like tested this? Like how applicable is this? Because often these yeah. simpler cases sometimes work surprisingly well, right? Yeah, I know. I, I speak as a, a very much an outsider to economics, right. uh, both politically and also in terms of practice. Yeah. Um, but I, ha I have read about sort of, uh, yeah, experimental economics where they're actually testing on whether people do things like there's a, a situation where you can either uh, receive something very small or punish someone else who's acting like a dick. And people will, it, it would be rational to choose the situation where you get something rather than getting nothing. Right. Yeah. But people, if someone is actually, actually act like being mean to other people, people will, and yeah, not everybody, but large number of people will make the choice to punish the person who's acting like a dick, but get nothing themselves, right? And so there, there is some like interesting ideas about uh, fairness and altruism, and these are the kinds of things that are being tested in in small group settings, in again with you know undergraduates in a, in a lab. <laughs> I mean, they're still um, receiving something though; it's just not material. Well, yeah, I mean that's the and then the, the question: Can you put it? How do you 
Yeah, I have I have a function u. I can measure it, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's 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 a tricky one. I mean, I, again, it's not a literature I'm super familiar with. Yeah. Um, sure. But there certainly is a literature on those kinds of things about does rationality work? Under what situations are people rational? Are do people uh, do big numbers matter versus small numbers? And they do. Yeah. Right? Like, you know, marketing tells you that. <laughs> it's 1999. Oh, it's 20 bucks. You know, <laughs> it's like you don't have pennies anymore. <laughs> It's the same price. No, it actually is the same price as your main cash, right? Yeah. But yeah, 999 looks cheaper. Um, and so there's all sorts of weird psychology going on. Um, yeah. Could you give us an example of this so that we can get ahead when we do trades on World of Warcraft? <laughs> <laughs> but the question you have to answer before you do this is, do you know yourself? <laughs> 